together. I ask you to open our minds and our hearts to receive the fullness of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Okay, so we are the body of Christ. Say that with me. We are the body of Christ. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, we are the body of Christ. The body of Christ is supposed to be like the body of Adam in uh, the Garden of Eden, physically, in that the body of Christ is supposed to be a self-healing unit. God has empowered us, and God has empowered His church to be a self-healing unit. Uh, uh, biologists will tell you that the human body is supposed to be a self-healing unit, that we technically should be able to regenerate cells. Anything that happens to us should be regenerated and healed. Uh, if cancer or virus or anything like that invades our body, technically our body should be able to fight it off. But they said something genetically has happened where that doesn't occur the way it seemingly should. In like manner... The body of Christ is supposed to be self-healing. <clears throat> when there are hurts, when there are conflicts, when there are arguments, when there are separations, uh, factions, dissensions, anytime things like this happen because the enemy attacks and the world creeps in, the body of Christ is supposed to be able to heal itself r rather than going kind of the direction that the human body goes now. You get cancer and you fight it and you fight it and you fight it, but the, the disease continues to degenerate and eat away at the body in the same way uh, uh, complaints, problems, anger, bitterness, uh, uh, problems that occur in the human mind and the human heart regarding relationships with other people in churches tend to be the same way. They tend to be like cancers where once they grab a hold, they, you just can't get rid of it. It keeps going and going and going. And yet, we are supposed to be a self-healing unit. Now, one of the things that God has given the body of Christ to help heal itself is each other. Take a look at the people around you for just a minute. These are your antibodies. These are the, these are the, the people who God has sent to help heal you and help heal the body of Christ. I want you to turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi... It's not pronounced Malachi. Malachi was a post-exilic prophet around 400 B.C. or earlier when the Israelites were released and came back from Babylon and they got back to Jerusalem and they saw that the entire city had been nearly destroyed, that the temple was laid waste, that the beautiful temple of Solomon that had gold on the walls and jewels ensconced on the walls and the windows, the beautiful Ark of the Covenant that had been there, all these things were gone. Their homes were gone. Their family homes were gone. Uh, uh, most of you can still remember where you were born and where you were raised. And, and it, it's kind of like going back there and seeing that home devastated and flattened. So... Contemporaries like uh, 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 Nehemiah and Ezra were uh, prophesying to these people, trying to encourage them. Malachi, on the other hand, had a, had, a, had a very different role. God sent him as a messenger to give a certain message to his people. Because what was happening was this. And see if you can draw any correlations between what was happening in post-exilic Israel and today. They just got back. Their home was stated. And God said this to them. God said, concentrate on my house. Rebuild my house that I might be worshipped and I might be glorified. And I will bless you. And I will bless this nation. And I will heal you. And I will raise you up and make you a greater people than you were before. However, the Israelites did not respond this way. And we've been told a similar thing, right? Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, then all these things will be added to you. So put the kingdom of God first. Put the, your prayer life first. Put your worship life first. Put your Bible study life first. Put church first. Put these before everything else. And when I see you prioritize me, I will bless you and I will help you and I will comfort you. I'll transform you into Superman. 
where you'll be invulnerable to the fiery darts and arrows and attacks of the enemy. So we have something very similar happening here. But the people didn't respond positively to that message. Instead, because they saw their homes devastated, they spent all their time at home. When they saw the degeneration of society, they were no longer a godly people. They were no longer godly-minded people. They were bringing over all the habits of the Babylonians. And frankly, they liked the habits of the Babylonians. The ba and, 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 and I need to tell you this. Satanic ideology always feeds into the ego of man. Satanic ideology is, 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 is designed to be seductive by stroking you and making you feel better about you and making you more important than God. Say that with me. You more important than God. That's what any satanic ideology has at its root. And that's exactly what was built into the Israelites by the Babylonians when they came back. They did not want to work on God's temple. They did not want to worship. They found that to be an extremely low priority. What they wanted to spend more time doing, more than anything else, is building up their own homes, building up their own families. And lines like, the kids come first, family comes first, uh, uh, my career comes first, everything within the society of post azilic Israel prioritized things that fed into the comfort of self and denigrated anything that glorified God. So things that focused on God got pushed down in priority, and things that gave them comfort, things that helped them, began to be lifted up and glorified. That's what the word glorified means. Kabod, Hebrew word, means making something more important, making something weightier, making something mean more. Well, when you make yourself mean more, when you make yourself and the things that are important to you mean more, what winds up happening is this. You are glorified and God is diminished. And God doesn't like this. And He responds in a certain way when that happens. Further, the idolatry of Babylon was creeping into the society within Israel. These are supposed to be godly people, but because they were surrounded by, for so long, this worldly, idolatry-ridden uh, uh, influence and culture... They couldn't get it out of them. And they actually liked this. They actually liked the Babylonian culture and they wanted to hold on to a lot of it, although their Torah, their Bible told them, we're supposed to get rid of all this stuff. We are not supposed to allow the priorities of the world to creep into and affect us. Now, into this environment, Malachi, the, word, uh, the name Malachi means messenger, my messenger, the one I sent, almost like apostle, Malachi is sent to address this issue. And it introduces a foundational but very, very powerful point. And that is this. God will use people to bring you His message. Even back in post-exilic uh, uh, Israel, people said, well, if God wants to talk to me, He can't. I'm not going to listen to any prophet. I'm not going to listen to any priest. I'm not going to listen to any prof, uh, 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 preacher. They don't know anything more than I do. If God wants to get my attention, He will move within my heart. He will move it within my mind and change me. But until God does that, I'm not switching. I'm going to stay in my post-exilic Babylonian mindset and maintain my priorities over God and over His kingdom. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, and let's start with the first verse. It says, See, I will send my messenger. This is God talking. I will send my messenger. To what end? Who will prepare the way before me? Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Now, how many want the, a visitation from God? Say, Amen. How many want more of the anointing and the presence of the Lord in your life, in your mind, in your heart? Say amen. You're hungry for that. You're God chaser. Here's the thing. According to what Malachi is saying, oftentimes the key to you receiving what God is trying to bring to you is not going to be found by you burying your face in your books. 
or you were off praying on your own. Because the tendency within the confines of human nature is to hear from yourself, pray the way you want to, and focus upon attaining the things that you want, and basically you scale all your prayers and all your focus and all your study on that. Like the post-exilic Israelites did. And God is saying, I'm going to prepare you. I'm going to prepare you to be a great people. I'm going to prepare you to be a temple. I'm going to prepare you to be those who I bless and those who I love and those who I use. <clears throat> but in, in order to have this happen, I'm going to send my messenger and he's going to talk to you. The plain fact of it is, God wants to affect your life, but he wants to use people around you to do it. If you will not listen, to the advice, the counsel, the exhortation, and the preaching, and the prophecies of the people around you, you will not be able to hear from God. Because this is the medium He wants to use. Your family, your friends, the people who surround you. He wants to use you to affect them. He wants, he, that's why He has sent you. That's why you're there. The reason you are there in that company, the reason you're there at that school, the reason you're there at that workplace, the, way, the reason you've been inserted amongst this, this group of friends is so that God can elucidate change in that culture by using you. He is trying to reach these people, and the way He's trying to do it is He has sent you. Now, in like manner, He's also trying to minister to you, transform you, and change you. But in order to do that, He's going to send people to you. He will send people that maybe you don't want to hear from because you're too proud or you're too arrogant and you get defensive. For me, as a man, I will tell you, he used to use my mother when she was still alive. He uses my wife. He uses my son. He uses the elders I have around me. I'm surrounded by pastor friends of mine, Guy Capelliella and Greg Hood and uh, uh, guys like that. I have mentors, Ralph Moore, David Godwin, who was just here a little while ago, Don Godwin, who's like a brother to me. So he has a lot of people that surround me. And here's the thing that's in common with mature believers, and that is they are free to advise, counsel, and exhort one another. But not so in the world, if you've noticed. Because of the influence of social psychology, there is a resistance to not only giving advice, but receiving advice. It is regulated and choked by that which is politically correct. And there are certain things that you are not supposed to mention and you are not supposed to bring up. But those very things that society says you're not supposed to bring up, the Bible says we are supposed to encourage one another and exhort one another. When somebody comes to us and tries to exhort us or encourage us to be better, we tend to be defensive. We'll use humor to laugh it off. We'll use temper tantrums or moody tantrums to just try to punish somebody and teach them, you don't dare correct me. You don't dare bring that up. Because if you do, I will bring this penalty upon you. And you can kiss this relationship goodbye. I call it the battle of, of, of wounded me. Where you try to hyper-emphasize how hurt you are and you just make everybody around you miserable because you don't want to hear this stuff. Guys, they tend to throw things around and yell and scream. Women will get moody and they won't talk to you for days, weeks, years even. They'll become resistant. Avoid the relationship. Oh, hello, I'd love to talk to you. i got to bounce right now. I will call you back. And how many of you know that call back never comes? And the next time you call them and they see it's you calling, there's no pickup. And now you get answering machine for the, for the next year or two. People get apathetic. That means they tell themselves, it's no big deal. He'll forget, she'll forget that she hasn't mentioned it. And they'll, they'll just pretend that you never said anything. You know, when you, when you, when you talk to uh, your son that way, have you noticed he tends to shut down and he doesn't answer? 
you know, I, brother, I encourage you to kind of watch your tone a little bit. And, and, and maybe, you know, your relationship with your son will be better. Ah! What does he know? I know my son better than I do. I know myself. I know I didn't mean it that way. I just blow it off. Or, they'll procrastinate. I call it Scarlett O'Hara syndrome. I'll just think about that tomorrow. And just constantly put it off. Do you know that procrastination is something the Bible addresses? Proverbs 3.28 says, Do not say to your neighbor, Come back later, I'll give it to you tomorrow when you could do it now. Bible teaches us we are not supposed to put things off and put things off if we can get to them today. Because if God, if you, if, if you do for God what he's, He wants you to do today, He can give you something else tomorrow. That's generally speaking why procrastinators procrastinate. At heart, they're lazy people. And they know if I clear my schedule by taking care of this tomorrow, which I had scheduled to do this thing, I have to do something else. But God means to transform us and mature us and change us and have us become the kind of people He wants us to be. So He sends His messengers. He has sent the people around you to help encourage you. Now here in this passage, He's talking about John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, but it also refers to the Holy Spirit coming into our hearts. Remember, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are the temple, God's temple, and that God's Spirit lives within you? That's 1 Corinthians 3.16, another 3.16 that I love. And it goes on to say in verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Well, if you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, if you are the temple of God... God does not want anybody to destroy this temple. In other words, when it talks about temple, it means a place where God can dwell. Matt, a place where God's presence and God's, God's, God's blessing can rest. He wants to live in you. He wants to live in your mind. He wants to permeate you. He wants you to become His temple. Now, this word here d- destroys Pharaoh. I hate that. There's a... There's uh, Pharaoh is the word. It sounds like Pharaoh a little bit, but it's a. F- but anyway, what it means is to corrupt, to spoil it, to make it to where God doesn't want to come in, to corrupt it, to fill it with sin, to fill it with anger, to fill it with fear. To fill your mind with so much sorrow, so much anger, and so much fear that God's trying to talk to you, but you can't hear it. Everything gets perverted and everything gets scrambled. And the message doesn't come through. That's why he wants to, that's why Satan wants to keep you angry. Don't you know that? He wants to keep you mad. He wants to keep you bitter. He wants to keep your mind focused on those things that ever hurt you. Because as long as you stay angry, or as long as you stay afraid, or as long as you stay inundated in self-pitying sorrow, you can't hear God. Or the voice that comes through in your mind, in your spirit, or your heart will sound different than God intended it to. That's not what I meant and that's not what I said. And you know what, Kella? Sometimes God stops talking. Because He knows right now I can't talk to you. You are clinging to your anger. You're clinging to your fear. You're clinging to your sorrow so tightly that no matter what I say to you, you don't hear it right. So right now i got to back off and I can't say anything to you because you're hearing it all wrong. You're allowing these things to scramble my message. If anybody destroys the temple, if anybody destroys, here's Richard Bowles, elder of the church, vital to the spiritual life of our church that he hears clearly from God. Well, if something can keep him angry, if something can keep him fearful, if something can keep him sad, he can corrupt all that and God can't get through. Well, there are three people who can do this. Number one, Satan wants to corrupt him. Satan wants to pharaoh him and make it so that he can't hear from God. Two, others can contribute to it. Others can so load him down with insults and discouragement and uh, enticements that he gets distracted, he gets pulled in different directions. 
But the number one personality that can destroy this temple is himself. Nobody has the capacity to destroy this temple more than he himself does. So, God sends us. God sends you. God sends me into Richard's life to be able to speak encouragement and to help him. Verse 2 in Malachi 3 says, But who can endure the day of the messenger's coming? Who can stand when they appear? We don't like being corrected. You say, but I want the Holy Spirit. I want God's presence. I want God to dwell in me. I want to be His servant. If that is the case, you have to want the input of other people and you have to want to respond to it in a positive way. Do you really want God to transform you? How many would say amen? Because, this is what it says in verse 3, for he will be like a refiner's fire or a launder's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites. That's you. You're the Levites now. Remember, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He will purify the Levites, refine them like gold and silver. For what purpose? Then. Somebody say then. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. Then you pray to God and He'll hear you and then He'll answer you and the relationship will be clear because all the fear and all the anger and all the sorrow will be ministered to and healed and taken away. But the only way that's going to happen is you will open yourself up and let yourself hear the voices of the brothers and sisters around you, the messengers who God has sent into your life. If you're resistant to that, if you avoid your brothers, if you don't want to talk to your pastor, if you don't want to talk to your pastor's wife, you don't want to talk to your elder, I don't want to deal with these people because they're always trying to correct me and I feel like I don't need any correction. I feel like it's them that needs correction. Your attitude is wrong. And all of us can become like that. That is human nature. But God wants to use those around you, your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends who are godly to transform and change you. See, if he's going to sit like a refiner, the way you refine silver or gold is you take this rock, this ore, that when you look at it, just looks like a rock. And you and I can look like just any single, any, any normal person who's filled with anger and sorrow and bitterness. And what has to happen to that rock is it has to be immersed in acid. Nitric acid, hydrochloric acid. That transforms and changes the molecular structure of the ore. Then it has to be heated up. And what happens is, <coughs> excuse me, the gold or the silver falls to the bottom in a gold dust or silver dust, and this sludge, trash, rubbish, junk that was trapping the gold, that was trapping the silver, floats to the top. That's called dross. And God wants to take us through a pro pro process where the dross comes to the surface, Jojo, and the dross gets skimmed off. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is you've got to be dropped in acid and you've got to be heated up. It's a very unpleasant process for this to happen. That's why God allows certain things to happen to you. Because he wants to see the dross come up and he wants to see you react to it the right way. And those around you react to it the right way. You know, Matt, when you get upset, this happens and this happens. Oh, really? Thanks for telling me. Appreciate that. You want to pray about it? Yeah, that'd be great. You know, Lord, in Jesus' name, help Matt not have this happen or not have that happen. Hey, thanks, Josh. That was, that was I feel different. Yeah, that's because God used Josh to exhort you, pray for you. He has authority over every demon and devil. And now, that transforms you and changes you. But maybe Josh isn't going to talk to you. Because you have so conditioned Josh by being dismissive and using your defensive screen of humor or avoidance or anger or whatever it is, moodiness to signal him, I don't want you to ever correct me or tell me anything I don't want to hear, then now, when he has a golden nugget from God and he is the messenger of God sent to you to help heal you and change you, he's blocked now and he can't get through. 
Who does that hurt? Not only you, but everybody around you. See, we are a chosen people. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you are a chosen person. You are chosen to change those around you. Christine, you have been chosen by God to change those around you. But conversely, you've also been chosen by God to be somebody who gets changed. Somebody who gets transformed. Your transformation affects other people's transformation in the godliness. Then I will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. See, many people offer their lives to the Lord, but they want to keep their baggage. I saw something fascinating. Uh, uh, remember years ago when Katrina hit? And, and, and there, were, there were homes that were devastated. Well, I remember this one report on CNN, and the report was about people who were not fixing their homes. They were allowed to go back, but they weren't doing anything to fix their home. And they were, this one, one lady was interviewed. and said, you know, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, you're here. And, and the reason that she was in the story was uh, that the uh, Department of Health was going to condemn her house and tell her, she, you can't be in this house anymore because it's all filthy and it's dangerous. You know, we've given you 90 days to address this issue. Then we extend it to 120 days. You're still just sitting there and you're not doing anything to clean the house or repair the house. We can't let you stay here if you continue to do that. Why aren't you? And the CNN report was, why aren't you cleaning your house? You know what her answer was? This was not my fault. What well, yeah, but it's your house. This was not my fault. I did not create this hurricane. I did not create this storm. I should not be the one who has to do this. And there are a lot of people who are like that in life. It is not my fault that I am this way. This happened to me. This happened to me. This happened to me. This guy attacked me. This guy hurt me. These people abused me. That's why I am the way I am. And I should not have to change. Instead, I should be able to stay like this and everybody around me in compensation and in punitive damages should simply endure me being like this because I am a victim. Well, you may be a victim, but you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you and I are the ones who are called to be among those who receive instruction, exhortation from God and allow His Spirit, not only in speaking to us through His Word and through His Spirit, but through all those around us, to be changed and transformed. How many would say amen? amen? Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We are supposed to sharpen one another. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16, believe it or not, it's another 316, says, If you sin and you say, if somebody sins and you see somebody failing God and and, and failing everybody around them, and you say nothing, God says, I am going to hold you accountable for what they're doing. There is a reason why I sent you there. There's a reason why you're there. You are supposed to say something to this person and try to help them heal. Try to help them. They're lost. They're hurting. They're in pain. They're responding this way because they're afraid. They're responding this way because they're angry. Somebody has hurt them. Somebody has taken something from them. They've been damaged or injured. They're sad. They need help. They need ministry. Somebody needs to minister to them and I am sending you my messenger to go talk to them. Iron is going to sharpen iron. I want to use men to sharpen men. Now, if you're going to sharpen each other, a couple points of advice. Be ready to be wrong. You know, I see this problem in you. Well, that's because this happened, that happened. Oh, I get it now. I apologize. No, no, that's okay. I appreciate you mentioning it. Well, I'm glad I'm wrong. That's one of my favorite lines is, I'm glad I'm wrong. Another line that's a favorite of mine that Josh and Patty have heard a million times is, you're right, I'm wrong. That clarifies it. See, if you try to mealy mouth it or equivocate, that doesn't work. But you say, you know what, you're, you're right, you're right, I'm wrong. I, I, I got that wrong. And you say it clearly, and you lay it out, you're fine. And people won't mind hearing from you later. But if you're not willing to say those things, 
You should not engage people. Here are some general guidelines, because I'm starting to run out of time here. You see something that's a problem in somebody? Grant Wacker, my pastor's, pa uh, my pastor's big brother, taught me this. Three-day rule. You see something that bugs you and catches your eye? Don't mention it for three days. And if you're looking for scripture reference, sometimes Jesus would think about something, he'd go off for three days to fast and pray about it before he would do something. And that's advice for us to do, by the way. So wait three days, pray about it, and say, you know, Lord, I want to talk to <coughs> Bernie about this, or I want to talk to Mary about this. Give me the words. Give me the timing. Give me the way. What should I say? How can I get through to her in a comforting, instructional, but uh, uh, encouraging way? And you wait for three days. Because sometimes we're irritated with somebody. It's not that they're sinning against God. It's not that they're doing anything. It's just irritating you. And that's not the same thing. Sinning against God and irritating you are not the same thing. Ephesians 4.31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Malice. You know what malice is? Malice is the desire to do something mean to somebody because you feel like they hurt you. It's not revenge. Revenge is the act. Malice is the desire. I don't like him anymore. I want to get him because he did something to me. I want to hold something against him. That's malice. The Bible says get rid of it. Number two. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. I cannot emphasize this enough. So everybody look at me for a second and stop writing. Go to them alone. Do not talk to others first to quote-unquote get advice. Go to them alone. Just you and them and talk to them. This should be your first point of contact. That's what Ma Matthew 18 says. If you go to them and they don't listen to you, then you go to friends and say, you know, I talked to so-and-so about this and uh, uh, I think this is a problem. What do you think? And if you agree, I, I want you to go with me to go talk to them. But that is step two. Everybody misses step one. That is, you go to them alone and you talk to them alone. And by the way, book, book of Proverbs says, a righteous man holds a confidence. A righteous man holds a confidence, but, but, but a wicked man uh, gossips. God hates gossips. He doesn't like it when people gossip. And you tell them, this is just between you and me. And over the years, that's, proven, that's been proven out. I've I, I got to tell you. Many times in the past, I'll talk to somebody and they'll reveal something to me. And they'll be standing there in a conversation with me and somebody else two weeks later. And they'll kind of fish around for it. And they'll realize, wow, Pastor Wendell did not say a word of what I said. Nobody knows, just him. I can tell he didn't even talk to this guy or this guy. It's like it was, it was totally confidential. And that'll give them the confidence to talk to you again. It makes you somebody who God can use more effectively. Be gentle, not argumentative or adversarial. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Have a scripture with you. If what you're talking about to somebody is just filled with I think, I feel, this is what I suggest, cut to the chase and give them something out of the word of God that will help. Because if you really love the Word of God, they'll have to nod and say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Don't add any extras. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says this, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You're not supposed to have anything corrupt come out of your mouth. Now, when somebody comes to us, we've got to remember, Proverbs 12, 1 says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Say that with me. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. And the second part, but he who hates correction is stupid. Again, he who hates correction is stupid. This is, this is God talking, not me. 
to God, you hate correction, you don't like discipline, you're stupid. That's His word, not mine. If we are smart, wise, righteous people, when somebody comes to us with something, you know, can I talk to you for just a minute? I, I, I wonder how you feel about this. If you do it the right way, Keller, there doesn't have to be anything wrong with it. You do it the wrong way and you create another thing on top of the thing. This is what I do. Hey, brother, can I talk to you for just a minute? And I give plenty of disclaimers. I may be wrong about this. I may have, mis I have, I may have misheard you. I may have not seen it the right way. It looked to me or it felt to me like this is what happened. Is that the way you remember it? Because if so, um, and here, here's, here's where we exhort, not correct. Um, I love it when you do stuff like that. It just, it, it would, it, I think it would be more effective if you also did this or you stopped doing that. So you not only give a lot of back doors and you give a lot of room, because you may be wrong, quite frankly. What I really, really advise against, unless you're really convinced this is totally true, is, uh, I want to talk to you for just a second. The Holy Spirit showed me, okay, the second somebody says that to me, whammo, my shield goes up. Because by my pastoral experience over almost 40 years now, 99 out of 100 times wasn't the Holy Spirit. And I know it wasn't because I said, yeah, but the Word of God says this. Uh, but I think in this case, that's not what it means. <laughs> like, there's no case in which the Word of God doesn't mean what it says. Okay? But that, that I really strongly against. Unless, unless you really, really feel like... And in, in that case, I would say, get it confirmed by somebody who has a prophetic gift first. But generally speaking, people don't like that. So give a lot of disclaimers. And the way you respond to it is, number one, with gratitude. Matt, thanks for, thanks for coming to me and sharing that with me. I appreciate that. Because, you know, when, when, when somebody like Matt comes to me with a word of exhortation or correction or something like that, he's risking the relationship. He's willing to lay it on the line. He's willing to risk the relationship because he wants to see me improve and he wants to see me do better. Now, to dismiss this, to be angry with this, or to mistreat him because he is being brave and trying to be obedient, as long as he does it in the right way, he's coming to me alone, he's going to maintain the confidence, he's willing to hear my response, and if he understands, oh yeah, okay, I understand, here's the thing. Explanations are great, excuses are not. Anybody know the difference between an excuse and an explanation? An explanation basically describes what happens. The purpose of an excuse is to assuage guilt. It's not my fault. It's one big, huge, it's not my fault. And that's what an excuse is. An explanation is, I did cause this, and that did happen, but here's why it did. Now I want you to help me identify whether I'm a, I was at fault in any, any place or not. D. Once you have this conversation... This is another look at me for a second and underline it when you write it down. Never mention it again. Don't keep bringing it up and hammering it, hammering. Remember that time I had to tell you that? Remember that time you said that really stupid thing? And some people are dumb enough to say it in a crowd. Yeah, one time she did this and did this, but the Holy Spirit sent me to her and I spoke the word of correction. But that was so stupid what you did back then. But, but don't ever bring it up again. If, it is, if, if a forgiven sin is cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness and God says He will never bring it to remembrance, this is the way you and I are supposed to be when we talk to somebody and once it's over, it's over. See, the whole point is... That's enough. The whole point is this. God wants to minister to and heal His body. We are all part of the body of Christ. But if we cannot talk to each other and we can't minister to each other, if a husband and a wife can't minister to each other, if children and parents can't minister to each other, if the members of a body can't minister to each other, if people who are friends, supposedly friends, can't minister to each other, i got news for you. If somebody will not take advice from you, I don't care who they are, they are not your true friend. And they will not come to you with something honest that's on their heart. They are not your true friend. This is an acquaintance that suits your ego somehow that you are referring to as a friendship because you know you look stupid if you don't have friends. 
God is not fooled by that. We're supposed to heal one another and we're supposed to minister to one another. So, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me pray for you. I'll be praying for myself at the same time. Number one, we're going to invite God to send His messenger. We're going to invite God to send people to help speak to us and give us encouragement and correction. Second, we're going to ask God to send us and give us the words and the methodology that we need. Ready? Here we go. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, I'm one of those people who is resistant to being corrected. I don't like that. I, 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 I can hear myself saying it. Lord, you just speak to me on my own, in private. That's enough for me. Well, Lord, your word just says it's not enough. This is the way you want to do it. So Lord, I don't want to hinder you from doing what you want in my life, my mind, my heart. Send whoever you want. Prepare me, Lord. And Lord, Lord Holy Spirit, I just ask you, uh, you know, if I'm challenged or if I get angry or if I get upset, could you please whisper in my ear, I sent them. Open my mind and my heart to receive instruction, receive encouragement, receive correction. And Lord, I also volunteer myself to be sent. I'll, I'll risk relationships. I'll, I'll do what I have to in order to see that what you want accomplished in somebody's life is done. Give me the words. Give me a gentle tone. Give me warm eyes that convey your love for them as I speak. Let me keep it short. Let me keep it really simple. Let it be effective because it's peppered by your anointing. And I give you praise and I give you thanks for it all in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Okay, thanks for coming. I'll see you guys Wednesday night.